Well, what I want to talk about today are two, I think, of the biggest struggles that FDR had in his life. And then one of the ways that we don't really think of when we talk about FDR, but how he was able to, I think, to process through some of this stuff. Um, I want to talk about the, um, the affair, quote unquote, that he had with Lucy Mercer. Um, and what that meant and how that came to be and what, that, what kind of influence that had on his career. And then we want to talk a little bit about um, polio. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about doctors and historians are now wondering whether he actually had polio or if he had Guillain-Barre disease. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then I want to talk about what was the place of faith in FDR's life? Because we don't think of him as having a a faith platform, but if you read some of his stuff and read his speeches and some of his public things and even questions he was asked, um, his Episcopal faith, his Anglican faith was very important to him. Um, and I think some of that helped him get through. Two crises, I think it would have just wiped most people right off the map. But this is a guy who has an incredible willpower, an incredible background of family, um, and able to pull through this stuff. So let's talk about, let's get the salacious part over first. Let's talk about Franklin <laughs> Roosevelt and sex. <laughs> um, you know, and it's 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 a it's a unique topic because it's an underlying bit of the story of the Roosevelts. No matter where you look, there are um, little subtle innuendos here and there. It's a very Victorian era marriage when they first get married. Um, Queen Victoria dies in 1903, um, but. The rules of marriage and the rules of uh, marital relations are governed by certain norms and uh, mores of society. Um, and another example, I hate to keep bringing up the Kennedys, but they're a good example of a similar family pattern. Uh, Rose Kennedy believed that marital relations were only for children. And once you had enough children, that was it. And she cut Joe off after Teddy was born. And then that kind of gave Joe, in, in his mind, carte blanche to kind of go on and off, although he's doing that before. And we see some of that with the Roosevelts as well. I mean, Eleanor, I think some of her um, insecurities about herself and about um, how she looked and what marriage is supposed to be about and whether or not Franklin really loved her um, were always there. Um, and that, in a sense, having children was what you did. That's why you had relations in the bedroom was to make children. Um, and that seems to be something she struggled with. She seems to, if you read some of her letters and things she said later to her children. Um, now, granted, this is in hindsight many, many years later, but there seems to be a sense of, for her, having uh, sexual relations with Frank was something she, it was a duty to do, and you had kids, and when you were done having kids, that was it. Um, I think part of the struggle from what I read in her mind was they had all these children. They had a, you know, there was Franklin Jr. who was the congressman from New York, who was good friends with Jack Kennedy and looked just like his father. But he was the second Franklin Jr. There was another Franklin Jr. who died after a few months of disease. And I think that sort of trauma can impact relationships and impact marriages. Why go through that pain again? They had other kids, but I think it took some work on both of their parts to allow that to happen. Um, but birth control was not readily available to people all the time. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was kind of a new thing. And, and these kind of medical technologies were not around. Um, and if you go into the bedroom and have sex, you're likely to have a kid. Um, and that was a fear. And the more kids she had, the more she felt, I think, um, inadequate. If you read some stuff, I think I talked about one of the things they found out she did to give the kids out side time was to put them in a cage that she constructed and hanging out the back window of their townhouse in New York City. Somebody saw that and like, I don't think that's the best way to let your kid be outside, but it was a different world. That's a hundred years ago. Um, so who knows what she was thinking, but it, she struggled with being a mother. Let's put it that way. She loved her children. They loved her, um, but she struggled with the just everyday part of being a mom. It was difficult for her. Um, and that, shows itself up in their relationship, how it changes. Um, and part of that is when they go to Washington, when Franklin becomes the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and they go to Washington, 
she now has a whole set of um, responsibilities in, in addition to being a mom. Um, another set of responsibilities she has to, to worry about. And that is being in the community, going to other wives' homes, leaving her card, saying, hey, we'll have a cocktail. There's Peter. Um, saying we'll have a cocktail party. There he is. Morning, Peter. Um, saying we'll have a cocktail party, and how do you, how do you organize that? And we've talked about how insecure Eleanor was and how she didn't like to be in front of people. And now she has pe people at her house, and she has to do some kind of small talk and introduce people, something she really doesn't like to do. Um, so to offset that, she brings in a, um, a young woman to be what they would call her social secretary. Uh, she's a woman by the name of Lucy Mercer. She comes from a long-standing South Carolina family. Um, Mercer is a name that shows up in Revolutionary War history, and I'm sure if I looked far enough back in the Lucy story, there's some connection there, but I'm not sure. Um, her parents um, were well-established society types. Um, her father uh, knew Franklin um, back in the day. Um, at the Metropolitan Club in New York. Um, so there is some connection. Um, but their parents had fallen on hard times. They got divorced and fallen on hard times. Um, and Lucy, as a young woman, needed to find a way to support herself. And through connections, possibly through her father knowing people, um, she heard about this job with Eleanor Roosevelt. And she was hired for the job. And her job was to answer Eleanor's correspondence and help her figure out which group she should go talk to, which group she shouldn't go talk to, kind of play out her time well, plan her time, schedule her time. She's kind of like a day timer. She's gonna figure all this stuff out for Eleanor. Um, and that becomes also something that they do. She becomes, I'd imagine, babysit the kids once in a while, take them for a walk, just help out around the house. And she becomes part of the family. Um, and for the first couple of years, I don't think there's anything there. I think she's seen as this very young, um, patrician young lady um, who's helping out around the house and helping Eleanor, and there's nothing there. But the more and more that they stay in Washington, and the more that Eleanor goes off to places, the more that Eleanor kind of says, no, oh, I like all this social stuff all the time. Um, Lucy becomes a, 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 a more permanent and prominent fixture in the Roosevelt household. Um, Franklin is not above flirting. I mean, he's a notorious flirt. Um, there are stories of them on their honeymoon where Eleanor wrote home about um, how Franklin was over here talking to these ladies all the time. And she's kind of hiding in the corner. This is on their honeymoon. He's, he's that kind of personality, right? This is the guy who meets the King of England at his house um, in Hyde Park. I'm using it. Oh, what do you need it for? I mean, how long do you need it for? Okay, bring it back. I need tech um, my tech guy just took my part of my tech program. Um, so he's very flirtatious. He greeted the King of England with a Hiya George rather than the proper language. He's just, he's down to earth. Everybody's the same in his mind, male or female. Um, kind of reminds me what Lady Bird Johnson said about Lyndon once. She said, Lyndon loved everybody in the world and half the people in the world are women. <laughs> um, so I think Franklin's that kind of guy he likes to have people around him he likes to have people kind of fawning around him he, he loves as you hear about from Catherine in a couple weeks one of the things he likes about um, uh, Lucy is that she just eventually falls totally head over heels and works the ground he walks on so does Missy Lahan so does Grace Tully they give everything they have to this guy he, it's not just women that do this. He's, he's got men, like his friend Livingston Davis, who was a Harvard friend of his, um, goes through his entire life. He's just at FDR's beck and call. He's the guy that can kind of make FDR laugh. He will do silly things to make FDR relax and FDR to calm down. Um, he has people like this around him at all times. I think a lot of times great leaders like that have those people around them. There's people um, that just are there to kind of break the strain of life and uh, I think Lucy provides some of that at some point in this relationship um, 
It's clear, too, that at some point earlier on, Eleanor suspected something was going on. She writes notes to Franklin um, from Campobello, and there's some tone in her voice about, eh, what's going on? Hope, hope you're not hanging out with Lucy, that kind of attitude. Um, and he does everything to calm her down. Um, she called him honey. He called her Babs. And they, these letters talk about how much they love each other, and he would never do anything wrong. It's like he understands that she's kind of trying to find some information, and he kind of pushes her away. You don't have to, I'm just, I'm sitting here in DC bored. I got nothing but Navy work to do. Don't worry about a thing. Um, because what happens is that when Eleanor's n not there in DC, Lucy still comes to the house a couple times a week to catch up with, with Eleanor's correspondence. So she's at the house when Eleanor's not home when Franklin is. And I think at first it starts out as an innocent platonic relationship. Um, Frank goes places. He needs some kind of person to go and they may meet up and run into each other. There's one story once of um, Franklin going on a little cruise. He used to like to take one of the Navy small boats down the Potomac for afternoon cruises and a bunch of his friends came. Livingston Davis was there and Lucy was there and Eleanor waffled whether or not she should go. And she finally decided to go and she drove down, you know, past Mount Vernon down the Potomac down there try to catch the boat, they docked. And people said there was a lot of tension on the boat. This is before anything was discovered. So I think clearly Eleanor has a suspicion that there's this beautiful young woman hanging out with her husband all the time, that something's not right. Um, she had, she was onto something clearly. Um, at some point, um, she lets Lucy go. And where does Lucy end up working? Anybody know where she ends up working? At the Assistant Secretary of Navy's office. Whoa, who knew? How clever is that? She can go to do work for the Assistant Secretary of Navy. At this point, it's pretty clear to a lot of folks that something's happening. Um, and people see them in public in D.C. when Eleanor's not around. There's a great quote from um, Alice Roosevelt, Teddy's daughter and not a good friend of Eleanor's at all. Um, what did she say? So people started saying, hey, you know, what is Franklin doing by being seen with this woman in town? They were seen driving through Rock Creek Park. They were seen out to dinner and at social events. And, and when people criticized um, her and when someone criticized Eleanor and put her in a humiliating light, Alice was part of this program. Alice was happy to say, write notes to Franklin, say, hey, I saw you um, on your drive the other day, but you didn't see me because your eyes were on the girl next to you. You were clearly weren't paying attention. <laughs> so one of the things Alice said though to Frank, she, she let, Alice wasn't shy to let Eleanor know she knew things, kind of hinted at things. <clears throat> and she said, when someone criticized her, you should be nice to Eleanor about this stuff. Alice said, this is really nasty. Uh, Franklin deserves a good time. He's married to Eleanor. Oh, wow. That's, that's your family. That's your cousin talking. I remember there was an old quip, an old SNL skit where somebody was playing FDR, and he said, I have seen war, and I hate war, and I have seen Eleanor. I mean, there's this common perception that there were some problems there, and I think there were at some point. But a lot of folks, Alice Roosevelt Picker did not like her cousin and wasn't afraid to mock her and humiliate her in public and in private. Um, and that's a pretty good example. He deserved to have a good time after all he's married to, to her. Which doesn't make any sense because if you read the stuff about Eleanor, she's a wonderful woman who has a lot of personality and it's very fun <coughs> and vivacious in the right settings. So, um, you know, it's just something that develops. And she's noticed this, I think, for a long time. When Franklin walks in the room, he, boom, walks in the, everybody, there's a breath of fresh air, there's a, a buoyancy about him, there's this charisma about him. Um, you can't help but notice him, and she has to deal with it. But it's until Lucy's there. But um, part of Lucy's family background, too, oh, that's the other thing. Her father was a rough rider with Teddy, so there is this connection with the Roosevelt's. Um, they're very devout Catholics. One of the things that we've talked about in some more recent studies on this relationship 
is whether or not this relationship was a physical relationship. That it might have just been a love affair in the sense that they were sweethearts and nothing physical may have happened. We don't know about that because any letters that they had between the two of them were destroyed after a while. So there's any intimate details about their relationship, the physical part of it, we don't know because those letters were destroyed. Um, but some people think, and the woman who wrote, I think, a fascinating book about the Roosevelt's called Eleanor, Franklin and Eleanor. Um, I think this is one of the few books really examined just their marriage uh, wow. by Hazel Rowley. Um, she unfortunately passed away a few years ago, um, ironically, of a cerebral hemorrhage, um, which is what killed Franklin. Um, but her study is that their relationship between the Roosevelt's was not as made for convenience as some historians would have us think, that there was a real love affair there, but they loved each other so much in a way that they allowed themselves the freedom that they needed to have to be who they were and they support each other. So it's not her running off to, oh, I hate you, go do what you want, and him saying the same thing, because that doesn't seem to be borne out by, by their interaction, by their letters, by what people saw of them. Clearly, the discovery of whatever relationship was between Franklin and Lucy was very destructive to their marriage, as it would be to any marriage. Um, and it, it rocked the boat. And so what happened, how that was found out, I think we talked about last week, was Franklin came home from a tour of Europe at the end of the war, towards the end of the war, and got sick. And when he got home, he was put to bed for a couple of weeks. And as he was being put to bed and Ellen was unpacking his stuff out of his suitcase came a packet of letters between he and Lucy. Mm -hmm. And as Eleanor said, the particular bottom of her world fell out. Something mm -hmm. was just destroyed. Mm -hmm. And for a woman who has struggled so long and so hard with self-acceptance and who she is, this is a betrayal that cannot be overcome in some ways. Do you forgive and forget? Do you forget and forgive? Do you do both? It's a difficult thing. Um, but this is a thing that they had to deal with. Um, I think both Franklin and Lucy felt they were in love with each other. There's different opinions over how far he was willing to go. There's one school of thought. He was ready to divorce Eleanor and get married to Lucy. Well, that's likely not going to happen. She's from a pretty prominent Catholic family. Getting married to a divorced man isn't going to happen. Um, and also it's something that they think about with his career, where is he headed? In 1920, um, it's coming up. He hasn't run for vice president yet, but he has a career in mind where he's going to head. Um, and a divorce isn't going to go well for a campaign and a future in politics in 1920. Nowadays, as we know, it doesn't matter. You can do what you want. Um, but back then it was a huge, huge issue. And so the common thought is that they sat down, um, and said, well, let's, how do we figure this out? Some schools of thought is they just said, all right, I'll stay married to you, but that's it, the name only, I have things to do. And I think there's more to this relationship. And Hazel Rowley really got at this in, in, in her book, Frank and Eleanor. Um, once the Amazon picks back up, go get this one, it's one of the better ones. Or if you wanna check out, she has a couple of YouTube videos when she was um, speaking on a book tour about the book. If you just type in Hazel Rowley, R-O-W-L-E-Y, F-D-R, a couple different YouTube videos are clicked up. They're about 40 minutes long. And they'll really um, fill in some of the stuff we're talking about because she really has a different perspective on their relationship, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And she's one of those folks that doesn't necessarily think that there is a, a physical component to this relationship. When Lucy meets Frank and she's very young, and back in the 1920s, that... Catholic family thing, you know, if she sleeps with FDR, what if she gets pregnant? Then we have a whole nother kettle of fish to talk about, and that doesn't seem to happen. So most historians now don't think there was necessarily a physical component to that, but it was a love affair of the mind, of the heart. Um, and the only way for them to work on that other aspect was to have gotten married, but that wasn't going to happen. I think also it's pretty clear that Mama said to Franklin, are you kidding me? You want to, you're in love with her and you've got this family. And, are you nuts? And that's not even talking about the politics part of it because she wasn't all that big a fan of his political career. And I'm sure Mama threatened to cut him off. If you want to go, 
and divorce your wife and kids, I'll take care of them and you're out the door, dude. See ya. Go away. Um, that has to be some kind of factor in his mind. Um, but yeah, so after Lucy was let go from the, the house job, she ended up being at the Navy Department for a while. Um, but I think Franklin does, according to most historians and family members, promise Eleanor he will never see Lucy again. That is a bald-faced lie. <laughs> now, historians have, have shortly, when this story was, there are hints about this story in books from the, from the 50s, but nothing really substantial. To about Lucy Mercer was this great help to the Roosevelt family and was very kind, but there's no hints at anything else. It's not until the late 60s, 70s that the story comes out. It's in the miniseries, Eleanor and Franklin. Um, what the general's thought was that he stopped seeing her in 1918, he and Eleanor had their relationship and he didn't see her again until the end of his life. We now know because they found letters uh, um, between the two of them in, in Lucy's family vault. They were in touch as, as soon as a couple years after this ended. And it was gentle, like, hey, how are you? What's going on? How's life? Good, how are you? Nothing, and then it got more and more involved. And then at a certain point after polio, he starts writing a letter saying, hey, I'm going to be in Manchester, Maine next week on a fishing trip to Cops at Connie Lake, and here you're spending the summer in West Gadden. <laughs> not wink, wink. <laughs> Whether, and you do the same thing. I'll be in Augusta. I understand you'll be in Hollowell. That, those kind of letters back and forth. Um, we don't know if anything ever happened from those events, but it's possible. Um, and there were some pretty strong hints. Love to see you. I'm going to be in your state next week. Um, let's get together, maybe. Um, but he's pretty cagey about it. He doesn't say it. Let's meet on Friday at 245 at the corner of uh, this road and that road. He just kind of drops a hint. Um, and it's an example of back then, people didn't, hey, Peter, how are you? People didn't know all this stuff. I mean, letters were hidden. Letters are kept in families. Letters were squired away and historians think they have a set idea of what is all about what's happening then you find out oh there actually were letters and it kind of changes the attitude they did more digging and found out she was invited to um the inauguration a special car was sent to pick her up um and that relationship kept going on and on and on uh, and she was a huge part during the war years of visiting the white house there are um Examples, you have to log everybody in that comes to the White House and makes a call to the White House. And there's a Mrs. Johnson, whose name keeps showing up in the White House logs. It's not unlike when JFK was president, there was a Mrs. Campbell um, who kept showing up at the White House and phone calls being logged in. And you can't really hide those necessarily. They show up too often. One of JFK's buddies said, the only Campbell I knew was Campbell's suit. The problem is this is one of his mistresses and you can't hide them. Um, it's, you know, I watched, there's a fascinating miniseries out, uh, a movie out years ago called Conspiracy. Anyone seen that? It's a, it's a movie about the, um, the conference in which they decided the final aspect of the final solution. And it's all, it's Heidrich and all these guys, all these bureaucrats sitting around talking about what they're going to do, how they're going to move people. And it's all about logistics and timing. And the scary thing is they're having lunch while they talk about this horrendous crime against humanity. They're having lunch and it doesn't seem to bother them. Um, but at the end of the day, they were all told to burn their records. All of them burned their records except one guy and they found his files. And that's how they knew this conference happened. Lucy didn't burn her letters. She kept some of her letters between her and Franklin. And after she died, family members found this and like, oh, wow, hey, they were talking more and more than we thought they were. Um, but I think what Lucy does for Franklin, it gives him an escape from his life. Does that make sense? Um, to provide some kind of release from what he's doing, especially as president. Um, again, Roosevelt likes having people around him who worship the ground he walks on, particularly women. He thinks that's, he loves, he's a charming guy. He has his cousin, Daisy Sookley's around. Uh, there's Delano, Laura Delano is a cousin who's around. And they love him. They worship the ground he walks on. Um, 
one of these folks around him was this guy named Livingston Davis, who was a Harvard friend of his. And Livingston Davis, um, it seems to me he's got he's got a career and he's he's, he's divorced. He marries a woman from Far Harbor, um, but he's kind of you get the sense he's not around a lot in the history books. But when he shows up in the history books about Franklin, you get the sense that he please his job is to kind of keep his friend at ease and to have fun and to laugh. And there are stories about Livingston Davis that even I chuckled about. Uh, some of them are inappropriate. Um, he's one of the guys who goes on the, the boat cruises with Franklin off Florida um, after polio. But Livingston Davis is also having some issues because in 1932, he kills himself. Oh, wow. Uh, and I'd love to see more of a study on he and Franklin's relationship because um, he's a name that keeps popping up with some consistency, but it's also hard to find out much about him. I looked at the Harvard alumni stuff. There's a much about him. He was a banker and uh, that sort of thing. Um, but he's of that class of Roosevelt's that um, he's just keeping kind of floating on the surface. And when Franklin calls, off he goes to help out his buddy. Um, we all should have friends like that to some extent, I think. Um, so we know that um, the Roosevelt marriage is unique. And we'll talk more about that next week with Eleanor. But I think Lucy is a, is a permanent fixture in his life. It isn't, she isn't somebody who goes away. She's around. Um, it doesn't hurt to have a friend who's the president of the United States either because um, there are instances in papers they found of FDRs where she had asked for help for a nephew or, or something like that when the war came um, to get them something to do, something to serve. Um, so the question is, um, how do we look at this sort of thing? And what do we talk about when we think about our leaders? Do we expect them to have um, a perfect life where nothing ever happens and everything wrong? Or do we look the other way when these things happen? Does this mean he's a bad person? Um, we can talk about any of, these, any of our leaders, Kennedy and Johnson and... Um, all sorts of people who have, even Eisenhower had a lengthy attachment with his limousine driver during World War II. Um, does this make Eisenhower a bad person? I don't know. Does this relationship with Lucy Mercer make FDR a bad person? Or as Arthur Schlesinger once said, if she helped him to stay focused at all during the war, provide him some sort of relief from, from the burdens he had as President of the United States, this country owes her a debt of gratitude. Any thoughts? Anyone? I'm making you all talk. Oh, no. One at a time. Raise your hands. and. That, Mike? Yes, Marilyn. That's why we need a woman president. <laughs> okay. And women, there's no women presidents that we've been around that wouldn't have affairs with men? No, well, I think they're more focused on the job. Okay. Okay, well, there you go. There's there's a school of thought that agrees 100% with Marilyn. Um, there's no stories of Margaret Thatcher having an affair while she's taking the Falklands back from the Argentina. Well, she was such a pain in the ass who would have a, an affair with her anyway. Yes, Roberta. Hey, just wondering if any of this suspicion about the two was made public at any time, or was it all kept covered up? I think it was all pretty much kept quiet. I think it was an inside the beltway thing, as they talk about. Yeah. You know, that wasn't there then, but it's that mentality. Anything inside 495, which circles around DC, that's their own world, right? Then the rest was deal with. It does seem um, that way, doesn't it? But yeah, and I think there are people that know. Um, clearly, Alice knows the people. He doesn't hide it. In that sense, does that make he doesn't? But in that sense, I wonder what it was really all about. I think he was exploring, and I think in his mind, he needed a way to just relieve the stress of being the assistant secretary of the Navy and be in DC in the summertime. That's his in his mind. I'm not saying I'm not excusing it, but um, he didn't hide it. What I think he has understood that it would kind of be kept in the loop, and nobody would say anything to Eleanor when she came back unless Alice got a hold of her and started telling her stuff. And um, as we know, Alice was humiliating Eleanor once and got snipped at by somebody saying, wait, well, she's leave her on. He goes, 
Well, he deserves to have fun. He's married to her. So, um, I think about Lucy. The, uh, Lucy, what's that? I think the, the press corps was much uh, yeah. nicer to oh, yeah. any president in well, those days. Uh, certainly, if they could hide the fact that he had polio and yeah. was a wheelchair bound, and most people in the United States didn't even know that, that it was, uh, uh, that they would hide any kind of affair. There are only two pictures of him in a wheelchair. And if there were others taken, they were destroyed. Um, because they, were, they would say, hey, don't take a He would say, we'll get to this in a minute. He would say, don't take a picture of me getting out of my car. Like, okay. And they wouldn't take a picture of him getting out of his car. They love the guy. In the movie, in the miniseries, Eleanor and Franken, um, it starts out with her going to Warm Springs and finding he's passed away. And she's on the train. And who does she interact with first? Two newspaper men who say, you know, we're supposed to be objective, but we love the man. It was amazing. So I think Peter's right. The press score was a much smaller, was all guys for the most part at the time. Uh, and there's a sense of, ah, whatever he has to do to kind of, um, My, even, yes. I, I think the press wasn't into sensationalism as much as they are today. And Gary Hart really changed a lot of that. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Um, so Lucy is around for a long time. This is the thing I find fascinating. She shows up, um, she goes to the White House and Eleanor's not there, um, and is, is there for dinners and things like that. She also goes um, to Warm Springs in the spring of 45. And when the president goes to Warm Springs, it's pretty clear in 1945 that he's dying. Um, I'll show you the last picture taken of him. And you tell me what you think. Uh -oh. um, this is a man who clearly has wasted away. I can't make sure I can see myself and I can tell you what it is. You see him right there? Mm -mm. Oh, yeah, really thin. That's not the Roosevelt we ever remember. Oh, wow. Look how wow. sick he is. Wow. Now, Lucy had gotten married to a man much older um, because she needed at her age to establish herself and become, you know, do you want to be uh, uh, in that day uh, an old maid, as they called it? Um, she wanted to get married, be respectable, her, to restore her family's name. Her husband, Winnie Rutherford, was much older than she was. She was a, they had a very good relationship um, in spite of the fact she went to see Franklin once in a while. Um, so she's well connected and she brings this Russian artist into town to Warm Springs to paint FDR. Hmm. Madame Shumatov that she knows and has done paintings. And she's there painting Franklin when he dies. So here, I'll show you again the picture taken of Franklin the day, a couple of days before he dies. You see how bad and ill he looks. This is Madame Shumatov's painting of the same pose. Look what she did to him. <laughs> oh wow. She he looks much healthier. It's the same picture. It's based off the same photograph in the same sitting. She called that um what does she call it? Uh something discreet glorification. <laughs> wow. So you have a man who clearly is dying and who looks like he's dying, and um she paints him but makes him look a little more robust than he was. Okay. Not the FDR we knew from 1933, but he doesn't look like he's about to drop. Um, so Lucy is there that day when FDR dies. Um, she is quickly scooted out of town before Eleanor can show up. Eleanor finds out in the miniseries Eleanor and Franklin, which is based on Joseph Lash's uh, wonderful book, Eleanor and Franklin, which came out in the 70s, which really did the story of uh, Lucy and, and Franklin. Um, one of the other gals around, the, the Roosevelt cousins and, and staff, um, slipped and said, well, she was, and she said, what do you mean, she? Well, Madam Shumatov, but you said somebody else. That they had to tell Eleanor that Lucy was there, um, which I had to have broken her heart again. So I think she thought that it was over. Um, he was much better at hiding it in those intervening 20 years than he had been back in DC the first time. And to find out when you get to where your husband's just died, that this woman he said he never talked to again has been there, was with him when he died. 
That has to be a process I would never want to go through. How anyone could go through that, I don't know. Uh, just horrible. Horrible to find that out. Um, one of the people that helped this process out and helped Lucy get access to the president was his own daughter, Anna. She lied to her mother and, and snuck around behind her mother's back to get Lucy to come hang out with her dad. So that had to hurt as well. Not only has your husband betrayed you, but your daughter's betrayed you as well. Mike, where did he die? Where? Yes. In Warm Springs, Georgia, at little, the Little White House. We'll talk about that a little bit later on in the week, but uh, okay. about an hour south of Atlanta. So I just, if he was dying, I just wonder where Eleanor was when he was dying. She was doing her job as first lady. I mean, he was dying for a long time. He never should have okay. run for that fourth term, I don't think. Uh, okay. But um, people thought it was important that the same person run for president the fourth time. We didn't want to kick the horse out of the stream in the middle of the, of the war. That doesn't work. But if you that look at the, him. That was the argument that was made. Yeah. And I do remember when he died. Yeah, yeah. That'll be 75 years ago. Next Sunday will be 75 years since FDR died. So, wow. So the other big thing, so here's this marriage that is going pretty well and it blows up and there's an affair and da, 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 all that comes with it. But shortly thereafter is the episode of polio. So let's switch gears, another sad, st stressful thing that he had to deal with. I think none of us, where he gets the inner strength to do this, sometimes I don't know, but to have your marriage almost collapse, lose a race for vice president, and then you get polio. It's just unbelievable. Um, we talked a little bit about last week that that likely got into his system. It's a virus like we're dealing with now um, <laughs> that got into his system when he was at a Boy Scout camp in upstate New York near West Point at Fair Mountain. Um, and the reason he's at the Boy Scout camp is that's one more way to get him keep his name in the papers. You know, they're going to send a photographer up and if they don't, they'll take a picture and send it to the New York Times. It'll be like page 10. FDR goes to Boy Scout camp. What a great guy he is. Um, but he goes to Campobello that summer with the whole family. And, um, you know, he's not a guy that's quite, he runs around, he plays, he roughhouses with his kids, he tosses them around, they go swimming, they go sailing. He fell out of their boat one afternoon and he complained of a chill and then he, it hurt. Okay. So he goes back to the house. He's like, oh, I don't feel good. He changes out of his clothes. He still doesn't feel good. He's going to take a nap. He gets up from the nap. Um, they have dinner, and he still is, like, not feeling good. And not just needly pains, but sharp pains in the back of his knees. Uh, and he gets a fever. So he goes to bed. Well, the next morning he gets up. He's not feeling very good. His legs feel like they're not working really well. He can still move, but something's wrong. So Eleanor calls a doctor in town who's a retired doctor of, like, 10 years. He hasn't been a doctor. But he's the guy in, in, in Lubeck that can come over and help out. And he comes over and he diagnoses a bad cold. I don't know how many colds you get a, a fever and stabbing pains in the back of your legs. Um, but that's what he thought it was. A couple days bed rest to be fine. Um, but within short order, his legs didn't work at all. He tried to get out of bed and they buckled. And pretty soon, he can't feel them. And there's this feeling that it's just moving up his body into his, his midsection up to his chest. Within a few days, he can't move his thumbs. Oh, wow. He has face paralysis. He's having a hard time breathing. Um, now it's time for getting a doctor in who's a little more experienced with what may be happening. Um, and so they put out a call for a, a specialist to come up to Campobello. So understand that's what a four and a half hour drive in a car going certain miles an hour today, and you're gonna get someone from down this area, that's a day or two to get up there via train or whatever. That's just, it's, it's isolated. There you go. Isolated. Um, but this is what happens. So a Dr. Keene comes in the town. He misdiagnoses this at first. And it's a Dr. Levitt who believes, based on what Franklin is presenting, that this is polio. Polio is the scourge of that era. Um, it is a thing that shows up in towns and in places around the world periodically, and it's, it's, it can be deadly. What uh, year is that? Uh, 1921. 1921. August 1921. So um, there's a real fear of it. And it's something that um, 
attacks indiscriminately. And like I said, it's, it's not unlike the coronavirus that it attacks you and it can attack you and you can walk away from it with little damage or it can totally incapacitate you or it can even kill you. Um, Roosevelt, I think, was lucky. He was a very healthy guy, very sharp, very vigorous. I think that helped him in the long run to help fight this off. Um, you know, it's not unlike when President Reagan was shot. He was 69 years old. That bullet missed him by, missed his heart by less than an inch. But because he was such a healthy 69-year-old who still cut his own wood and went riding, and did, that probably saved his life. Um, so just a, a rationale to make sure you're all getting out and doing some exercise in this time of, of stuff and get, stay healthy because that helps fight off the viruses as, as much as we can. Um, eventually, the paralysis of the face and the upper extremities and the hands will go away. He can move that stuff. Um, but the legs refuse to work. Now, the thing Franklin talks about, and he mentioned to the doctors, was even the slightest breeze would be excruciatingly painful for him. Huh. Just being outside and thinking outside, just the open window on his legs was like someone was stabbing him in the legs <coughs> with pins. Um, that's a part of polio that some doctors don't think is indicative of polio. We'll talk about that in a minute. So what happens then is some doctors think, well, massage the legs, get those muscles working, get the blood flowing. So Louis Howe and Eleanor take turns massaging his legs, which is excruciatingly painful. Eleanor has to be the one, she becomes his 24 hour nurse. She has to give him a catheter. Oh, wow. go to the bathroom. This, these are not the actions of a woman who hates this man. She loves him so much, she's willing to debase herself that level to be his nurse, to change his, black, his catheter, to wipe his behind, to do all this stuff, because he can't do it. And she moves into the room, she sleeps next to him, and works herself to a frazzle. Louis will come in and do some. Um, Massaging. I can't imagine. It's, um, I was in politics to have my political consultant rubbing my legs. I mean, that's above and beyond the call of duty, I think, too. Um, they finally get a full time nurse eventually to help out. There's a little bit of jealousy going on there because she's a very vivacious redhead. Um, and she, Frank likes to flirt with her, which helps keep his mind off the other problems she's had. But eventually she's let go because she's a little too cute and too nice. Uh, and Eleanor's like, oh, I don't want that stuff around the house. Um, but um, he has to, his correspondence is taken care of. Uh, Missy Lahand, who started working for him in 1920, comes to Campobello and helps out with correspondence. Um, the word gets out. They downplay this disease to the press. And again, like Marilyn and Peter said, the press is pretty compliant. Oh, so they say he's a mild case of polio. Oh, he'll be back up walking around in a couple of days. Really? Well, that's what you did back then. They even downplayed it. Mama is over in Europe, and she comes home, and she's met by a note, a telegram from Eleanor saying, Franklin's been very unwell lately. Not Franklin might die soon, but Franklin's been, he's been a bit under the weather. But you should come see him. So Mama is all freaked out as well. Um, a month after this virus strikes him, they bring him back down to New York City. You can't get the medical help at Campobello that you can in New York. You have to exchange the beautiful sea breezes and the open air for the city, but the medical help's not down there. Um, there are two wonderful movies about this event. One is called um, Sunrise at Campobello. You remember this from the 19, 1960 with Ralph Bellamy yeah. and uh, Greer Garson. Yep. Fantastic. But this ends when they take him on the train uh, back to New York. And in Warm Springs, with Kenneth Branagh and Cynthia Nixon talks more about the recovery aspect of it at Warm Springs in Georgia, we'll talk about in a minute. Of course, when they take him on the train to send him back to New York, it's all choreographed. He has his famous campaign hat on, his cigarettes, uh, and he's waving like there's no big deal. I'm just going down to New York City to have some medical tests. And he's laughing and telling jokes this is something he does again and again and again and again and again, is to get people to not pay attention to what's below. What's above is his personality and his brain. Um, as he develops later on, an ability to, to be seen as walking. Part of what he does is he has people, his kids in particular, the boys, work out so that they can 
help him walk. Um, and if you go on uh, YouTube, there are a number of different clips of Roosevelt showing this, this walk he perfected, this walk that he worked on. Um, and he got pretty good at it. When he first started out, it was pretty nerve wracking and you can see him almost fall. But after a while, there's a video they found from 1936 and it hardly looks like he's throwing at all. He got that good at it because he knew in his head, there's no way he's going anywhere if people think he can't walk. It's just the way it was. Um, so he goes down to New York. He gets specialists in polio looking at him. Um, but the progress doesn't seem to be there. Um, some bits of muscle come back and most of it does not. Um, <clears throat> so this leads into a whole question of what disease did FDR have? Um, let me pull up an article. Um, so the consensus has been for years that he had polio, that he established on, that's what defined him, right? That's his story. But in, in 2013, um, a group of researchers uh, looked at this and decided they thought he had Guillain-Barre disease. Um, it's spelled G-U-I-L-L-A-I-N hyphen B-A-R-R-E syndrome, Guillain-Barre syndrome. And they based that on find the differences. There's things that um, Roosevelt had, there were symptoms like the pain in his legs, the fact that a breeze could really cause him pain. Those were not indicative of polio victims. That is a Guillain-Barre disease defining thing. The fact that this came on so quick and recovered, um, they're just different. I don't have uh, the background. Um, here's an example. Six of the eight symptoms that he had, favored GBS, we'll call it, 98% Roosevelt's paralysis was symptomatic and ascending and progressed more than four days, whereas the paralysis in polio is uh, typically Asymmet, I can't this is a much a variable and it's asymmetric and progresses for two or three days. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that the GBS progressed longer than that, um, his numbness and uh, sensitivity were not something you feel necessarily in polio, but GBS, it's much more common. Um, his descending pattern of recovery from paralysis is absent in polio, but common in GPS. The facial paralysis that he had for a while is common in GPS. Um, his prolonged bladder and bowel dysfunction are rare in polio, since polio viruses do not attack autonomic nerves, but are common in GPS. Um, so these are just some things that doctors looked at about 10 years ago, um, and by using kind of uh, common denominators, they some people think he didn't have polio, he had this other disease, but they weren't looking for that when they diagnosed him. And the common fear was polio. That's what people had. This GBS is pretty rare. So um, two of the things that, two of the eight symptoms favored polio. Um, one was the fever that he got, which is rare in GBS, but it's pretty common in polio. And he had permanent paralysis, which occurs in about 50% of polio survivors, but only 15% of GBS survivors. So you can pick or choose uh, it's a medical, and it's one of those coulda, shoulda, woulda things about history. What did he really have? Um, did Lincoln have Marfan's disease? We don't know. Um, and at the end of the day, I don't think it matters what he had, because what it did to him and how it transformed him is what's important. Um, so he's always looking for new cures. The, the, the doctor's in New York. He's at home um, in New York City, at his house in New York City, trying to recover trying to keep his, his presence up in the world. Louis is always writing press releases. Um, and he's really trying to figure out a way to get back in the game, so to speak. But at the same time, you read about this, this episode in his life, the depression had to be just unbelievable. A man who was so young and so violent and so willing to do things and was counted on being around. You watch video of him, he's he never seems to walk into a room. He kind of bounces into a place. And he can't do that anymore. To the fact that you get to the point where your biggest fear now is getting out of your house in a fire. 
Mm. And he would practice going up and down the stairs in Hyde Park, pulling himself up and down. So he didn't want to bother anybody else. So he had to be able to get out of the house by pulling himself out of the house. He practiced that for hours on end. As he got into using crutches, after they fitted his legs with braces, his goals became things like, he talked about, about getting down the driveway, walking just one time all the way down the driveway. These become his goals in life for a while. When you have a career plan ahead of you like he had, the realization that this might not happen has got to be very stressful and very um, depressing for him. I think he deals with this stuff, which is why he has people like Livingston Davis around, um, Lucy, not, well, Lucy eventually, but why he has uh, Missy LeHand around, uh, his cousin Daisy Suckley around, Louis Howe around, because they keep his mind off it. I mean, you don't see pictures of FDR or hear about him in public being looking depressed and acting depressed. He always projects an image of being positive and focused on the thing at hand. Um, and I think he believes at all times he'll eventually walk again. A lot of people couldn't have done that. A lot of people wouldn't have been able to do that. But he finds a way deep inside to focus on what's important, um, to try new therapies. He's almost willing to try anything new that'll show up. If you write him and say, hey, if you pour the blood of a duck on your legs, it might make you, he might try it. Um, um, and what happens eventually, he goes through two phases in the 1920s. He has a phase of deep depression. He rents a houseboat <coughs> in, off the Florida Keys. And he disappears for weeks and weeks on end, often without Eleanor, but it's people like Missy LeHand and Livingston Davis and some others that go with him. And he just kind of sails around and he can swim. Um, he can play cards, he can drink, he can do whatever. It's kind of his therapy to kind of get through this, to kind of let himself get to the bottom. It's not unlike Amy and I were talking a couple weeks ago about with this virus stuff, when it first started, Getting around, I let myself go to like the deepest depths of like, oh my God, this is it. I better get a shotgun because the zombies are coming. We have no food. <laughs> We're all going to die. And when I pull myself out of that, it's been fine. Amy did the same thing. She actually went and squirreled food away and money away so that John and I could flee to Minnesota to be with my family for the end because she thought it would just be, but you know what? Thank God she got out of that because as a doctor, she needs to be more positive than that. But Franklin, I think, is the same. Letting yourself go to that deep despair and not going like his friend Livingston Davis did to the ultimate end, but allowing yourself to come back out of it can adjust your life and how you see things, I think. Um, and so these trips on this houseboat of swimming and drinking and hanging out with these women, um, that's part of his therapy. Um, but at one point in 1924, in the late summer, he gets notified of this place in Georgia called Warm Springs. Uh, Peter. <laughs> um, and I, I'm boring people, I'm sorry. Um, but he um, hears about this, this place in, in Warm Springs that the claims that there are waters in their springs that can help you feel more buoyant. The, 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 the mineral content in the water gives the water buoyancy that makes you feel like you're not just sinking all the time. Um, now, the guy who owns the place is a guy named George Foster Peabody. Remember that name, Peabody, from FDR's life earlier at Groton. Um, he owns this resort. And Franklin decides he's going to go check it out. Now, there's a family connection to the, the town that Warm Spring is now called Warm Spring. But at the time, it was called Bullockville. This is the birth area of his um, cousin Teddy's mother, Eleanor's grandmother, uh, Mitty Bullock. is from Bullockville, Georgia. So there's a family connection for him to go. This isn't like going someplace completely rare. There's a family connection. To Been a resort. People have gone there for a while to get away from things. But it's been falling on hard times. Um, there's a guy named Tom Loyless who's kind of a, seems like a sketchy kind of guy. Um, he's kind of making a pity for this place. And Franklin goes there, and the first day he's there, they take him to the pool, and he gets in the pool, and lo and behold, 
what can he do? He can walk. He can walk in the water. He can walk and feel like he's never done this in three or four years. The water, whatever is in the water, makes him feel buoyant, makes him feel like he can stand up. And so he can walk in the pool. And he figures this may help him learn how to get his muscles back. But at the minimum, it gives him that feel in the water. It's not unlike when you see the astronauts training for um, the Apollo programs. What do they train oftentimes? In the water. Because what does the water do? It gives you that feeling of, of the zero gravity you're going to need to have in space and on the moon. It's good training. So it's kind of the same idea. It's a therapy for him. It gives him that feeling that he can do this again, that he can actually walk. Um, the other thing it really does is, um, for the first time, really, it, it forces him to interact with people who are not of his class, in a sense. Because the people that are coming here for therapy or kind of getting the word about this place are not necessarily rich patrician types from Hyde Park, New York. They're kids and, and adults who, this is their last hope. They've given all their money to come to this place. Um, and the people around there, Bullockville, Georgia is not Hyde Park. These people are poor. A lot of them are destitute. They're, they're, they're struggling people trying to make an ends meet. Um, and this is not, F, these are not FDR's people. But now he has a common denominator with these people because he can't walk and they can't walk. There's a commonality between he and these folks that he is able to connect with. Um, which I think is when you really start to see a change in who he is. Um, he loves this place so much that he eventually buys it. He uses almost all of his inheritance money, which means he has to go and talk to Mama. <laughs> Mama, I'd like to buy a resort in Georgia. She'd be going, you freaking kidding me. But <laughs> he eventually gets Eleanor to come down and see what goes on. And now, now he's got, he and Eleanor can tag team Mama. And she eventually helps him part with the money. He sells things. Um, to buy this place, to spruce it up, to make it a place. And word gets out, even in 1924, that there is a place you can go um, to get therapy. And they make it so it's low cost or free to people that can come to this place. This is the altruistic part of FDRs. He doesn't want to make this place when it costs you 10 grand to become part of my polio clinic. It's going to be affordable for you or free. Um, we'll raise money for this somehow. He raises money from his friends. He sells things he owns. He asked my mom for, for money. And the word gets out that this is a place to go. And Franklin becomes known as Doc Roosevelt. Huh. And he, he will try any therapy. He will get people to come and he'll do therapies with them. But mainly because of his attitude. When you come, you can come to hide to Warm Springs feeling down and depressed and sad. But he's not let you stay that way very long. In the movie Warm Springs, there are again and again stories of Franklin, there's a scene where there's a little girl who learned to walk in the braces like Franklin will learn to walk. And if you watch that and don't cry, you have no human spirit. To so watch his joy at seeing people he worked with learn how to walk in that sense. Um, the relations, the bonds he forms, people that come there and their surrounding community um, are really touching. And I think it's, it's something that he's learning as he goes along that'll help him when he becomes governor of New York and <coughs> the United States that there are people other than you suffering and they're suffering from the same thing you're suffering from and you should reach out and have some empathy for folks. I think his empathy really comes through in this time. Um, they develop a car for him with hand controls. Um, he gets in this car and can turn it on and steer it and brake it all with his hands, which allows him a bunch of freedom to drive around the pine woods of north of northern Georgia, southern Georgia, I'm sorry. Um, that's got to be liberating for him. Um, if you ever get down to Warm Springs, one of the cars is there. And you can see that. And there's one at Hyde Park, too. The hand levers that he had that he can drive. Um, but he also understands, too, that to get back into politics, it's about image, right? It's not about, it's about imaging is a huge part of politics. And so he has to be seen to be walking again. He speaks at the Democratic Convention in 1924 but he goes out on crutches. And he gets asked in uh, 1928 to go back and nominate Al Smith. But he doesn't want to be seen doing this on crutches. That to him is a weakness. He can't, this is not gonna help his school career. He has to develop a walk. And he develops a walk with these braces on, swinging his hips. And I would say to you, Google FDR walk on YouTube and watch some of these clips because 
he perfected this almost to a point it, you don't even notice it. And what he also wants you to do is not look below to see what the hips are doing, but look at his head. And so more than once, if you watch clips of him walking into an event, you'll see him laughing with either his son or some other uh, military aide because he wants people to think, oh, you, you told me a joke. Don't look down at my legs that aren't working. Look, I'm laughing. <laughs> and that works. Because um, you don't watch, as, as you all said, and some of you who were around back then, they hid this so well. Um, you all didn't know. There are no statues of FDR on, you go to an antique store. Remember once up in Brewer, there was an antique uh, clock, an FDR clock. And he's, he's holding the clock and it's a ship's wheel. And it's, it's got that quote from, from Longfellow about stay on a union strong and great. And it's FDR like the Navy captain bringing the ship of fate in, but he's standing up and there are no steel braces anywhere to be seen. They cut his pants too long so you couldn't see the braces sticking out. Um, mm -hmm. Then when he sat down, it covered up pretty much that stuff. Um, there are very few pictures of him without pants on. You can see how withered and destroyed his legs were. Um, there were only two pictures that they know of of him in a wheelchair. There may have been others taken, but they were destroyed. As Marilyn said and Pete said, the um, press was much more um, supportive. And, you know, there was, you know, there, the, one of the videos of him walking, the person filming, and he gets like 10 seconds of FDR walking, and then an agent comes up and grabs the camera. Oh, wow. Um, this was not allowed. Um, Towards the end of his life, it was more and more common because he couldn't walk like he used to. When he, in 44, he did like a six hour swing through the boroughs of New York. It was his only real campaign thing. It was pouring rain, it was cold. And he got to uh, Ebbets Field um, to make an address. And if you watch closely, you can see him really struggling to move in the car to stand up. Uh, and there are more than one instance of people watching him stand at a podium and worried that a, a slight wind would have knocked him over. Um, mm -hmm. He perfected that walk. And if something bad, if his legs, his braces did lock, and he felt like that's when he really would say, let's laugh so they're not paying attention to the fact I might fall over. He did fall down a few times, but more often than not, out of the public eye. But he really perfected this walk. And I would just get a chance to walk. His determination and his understanding of what that meant to be able to walk again uh, is so important to understanding who he was. Um, so in 1928, he goes to Houston to nominate Al Smith for president and he does it and he comes out on stage walking with a cane holding onto his son's arm and the stories of um, from the press that day talk about here's this guy who was laid low years before we didn't think and he's literally walking into this convention hall it worked because they talked about how he was walking he wasn't in a wheelchair he wasn't there was a lot of controversy um, before FDR died, he said, they're going to make a memorial to me like a simple deal. And for years, the only Roosevelt memorial was a big block of granite outside the National Archives that said F. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 1882 to 1945. And then they wanted to, there's a whole big thing now in New York, in Washington. And I'll show you a brochure I have. It's the Roosevelt Memorial which is in D.C. I have not yet been to this, but oh, it's an amazing uh, place. Mike, I saw it. It's incredible. Crazy, isn't it? Yes. Acres and acres and acres of really capturing his personality. One of the controversies was when they built a sculpture of FDR, um, he wasn't in a wheelchair. And the cape that he was on hid. But if you look closely, what he's sitting in is a wheelchair he designed. He didn't sit in a regular wheel. He never did. He sat in a wheelchair of his own design, and often a kitchen chair with wheels on it. So he's in the wheelchair. And so it was a big discussion when they first built it. Well, you're not showing enough of his disability. He didn't show it. He didn't want it to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think they made it eventually a compromise understanding came to that. But um, it's an interesting part of his life. And it, I think it defines who he is and makes him who he is. Um, how does he get to that point? Um, there's a part of FDR's life. Have everybody's looked at the article I told you to look up on um, FDR when appealed to Scripture United a Divided Nation? Um, there's actually a couple of books written on his faith life. And it doesn't have to be, you know, I don't care what faith life a president has. 
Um, this one's written by a Baptist writer. <laughs> Simple faith of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, he's not a Baptist by any means, he's an Episcopalian. Um, his mother, Sarah, always carried the common, the Book of Common Prayer with her everywhere she went. So he's surrounded, his father is a um, vestryman at the church in Hyde Park. The Roosevelt family is one of those families that gives money for pews, you know, those, the New England, we buy a pew and put the, the name of the person on it, or neither has, has, there's, one of my favorite places to go is the National Cathedral in Washington, if you've ever been there, great, if you haven't, next time you're in D.C., go, because they have kneelers of all these people from American history, and they're quite amazing to see the hand-embroidered stitching on these kneelers of famous Americans, black, white, women, men, whatever, um, represent the best I think of that tradition. You cannot over, 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 uh, underestimate the influence of Endicott Peabody at Groton. Remember that's not just a physical component to growing up. There's a spiritual, there's what they call muscular Christianity. That uh, Christianity is not something to be kind of sat quietly and discussed. You need to get in there and help out your fellow man um, and that sort of thing. Um, kind of the difference between like say Mr. Rogers and um, here's another example. Uh, I don't know. William Wallace, the extremes of, of, you know, the quiet, thought-provoking Christianity of Mr. Rogers, which is always there, and the overmuscular Christianity of William Wallace, who you will take things by the sword and make people become Christian. Some, some example in the middle of what Franklin Roosevelt is. Um, but Endicott Peabody really tried to have – and that relationship stayed – with Roosevelt until Peabody died in 1941, I believe it was. Um, the Roosevelts both come from the same background, church-wise. They did not associate with people from other tradition. Um, so you can read and hear stories of Eleanor being uh, anti-Catholic. There are some anti-Jewish things that are said, kind of in passing once in a while. I don't think they're indicative of any deep anti-Semitic feeling. It's just kind of a thing that was okay back then. And that class, um, it's a different time. Um, but um, it's, it's, it's interesting to read. And I'd, I'd love to see more on anybody when Amazon can finally get um, our stuff to us in a little faster mode. We can read, I'd like to read more about his relationship. There's a quote I had marked in here. Um, Let's see, this quote here, let's talk about, this is a great quote about this stuff, He's, and it goes in with the polio thing. Roosevelt certainly had sympathy for the less fortunate before polio. It may truly have wanted to help them, but sympathy is not experience. Hmm. He certainly had sympathy for the less fortunate before polio and may have wanted to help them, but sympathy is not experience. So I think part of what we talked about is his experience in that combined with uh, his understanding of what, what God's role was in his life, um, I think helped him out. But um, this is actually a fascinating book. Um, clearly, Roosevelt's attitudes on women, on race relations, um, were not as advanced as, say, Eleanor's. Um, you know, the story of Eleanor with the uh, Marian Anderson singing at the Lincoln Memorial. And she quit the DAR over there with Susan Let Marian Anderson sing. Her attitude towards African American and women's rights were clearly different than his. That's one of the things she does is she brings an understanding to him of what that part of the world's doing and where they're thinking, which is why I think her relationship is so fascinating. Because he listens to his wife. That's her her part of what she brings to this relationship, that she's his eyes and ears when he can't get out. And um he changes slowly in some cases, but he's changing his understanding. Um, Eleanor later gets into a big uh, tug of war with Cardinal Spellman of New York. He accuses her of being anti-Catholic. A lot of us just didn't have a lot of experience. They're from a patrician world in Hyde Park. Everything's designed around them. So it's not just people's economic background, it's people's race and people's religious act backgrounds. Um, that impacts and changes over time. Um, but the article I thought was fascinating because it really got at, and the book talked about this too, is read some of FDR's um, speeches. 
and look at some of the stuff he's talking about. Um, and there are numerous references to what we call in this country civil religion, which is a general sense of a God figure in politics. And you hear politicians use it all the time. Um, you know, guys like Jimmy Carter, who's a very devout evangelical Christian versus Ronald Reagan. We used to laugh back in the day that Jimmy Carter taught Sunday school. Still did until last year when he got brain cancer. Um, but Reagan never went to church because it was not safe for him to go. Um, so how politicians use God is up to them. And people's reaction to that is always different based on how much they use it and what kind of words they use. Um, but um, Roosevelt, read that article because Roosevelt had a very sense of uh, devout language. He used the words, he used scriptural language a lot. Um, we don't think of it that way. But if you go back and read some of the stuff, you see that it's there, it's always there. Um, I want to make sure I get this right. They asked him once, um, what was his political stance? And I believe he said, um, he was a, what did he say? I'm gonna make sure I get it right because he had a, um, hmm. he had a, he had a interesting thing because he talked about he was a Christian, a Democrat and something else. And he, how he phrased it was interesting because it wasn't something you would actually expect to hear but I can't have the quote right in front of me. But he wasn't Wait, afraid. I have a question. Yeah. How did, uh, how did Roosevelt, Yeah become a Democrat when Teddy was a Republican, when um, his cousin was a, a uh... Well, because the Roosevelt- How did that happen? The Roosevelt's when it started out when they became Republicans, it was to support Lincoln because that was the party of Lincoln and that was the person that they admired and, and loved the most. And so some of them never left that, but they tended to be Democrat before that. And a bunch of them switched over to be Lincoln supporters, and they never went back. Well, I think their thinking was Democrat, but mm -hmm. in name, Teddy, you know, was he was yeah. a Republican. Different, different understanding of what those words mean today, too. Um, so, you know, religion and politics isn't something that's, that's new. It's been around for a long time. And people's comfort level with what that means and what the candidate means um, Remember 1928, it was Al Smith was Catholic, and there were actually things published and sent out to people attacking him for that. Same thing with Kennedy. Um, same thing with Mitt Romney. In 2000, he was a Mormon. Oh, no. Um, and at some point, there's a great clip from um, uh, Juan Meter's album doing JFK, and he's doing a press conference. And they uh, asked him what he thought about Senator Goldwater being a candidate because he was Jewish. And, and Kennedy said, well, I, I think uh, we'll have a Jewish president someday. I just know as a Catholic, I can't vote for him. So there's kind of those built-in uh, ideas that different religions are bad and they have no place in the public square. Um, and it's kind of been a thread through our country's history of kind of a, what they call um, kind of a national, there's a, there's an a national spiritual feeling from Washington on that God at some point is involved in this, how that manifests itself and through what tradition that manifests itself. It's kind of left up to in individual candidates to talk about it and people to judge him on it. But Roosevelt clearly, um, as a Democrat, uh, considered himself to be a devout Christian. He was church going. Um, he never hid from that, but you don't think about that when you think of Roosevelt very much. But there's actually been some more studies done a lot on um, that aspect of his life, which I find absolutely fascinating, because we're still talking about that stuff today um, and how that all plays out. Any questions about anything so far? Because we're almost done for the day. Uh, Mike. Uh, yes, Chuck. I have a request. Yeah. Uh, could you give a, at some point, kind of a short resume about the uh, the Roosevelt's children and, yeah. and their destinies. I, I campaigned one time in uh, West Los Angeles for one of the sons of Roosevelt. At least that's how I remember it. No, probably. And, uh, and I wondered, I can't remember which one it was. They all <laughs> ran off at some point. And I'll, I'll talk about that <clears throat> towards the end when we talk about legacy because 
it's I think it's fascinating to study the, the children of these people and how they handle being the children of these people. Oh, great. Whether it's, whether it's um, your Dr. King's children and you have this mantle to, to pick up and, and march on with. But how do you do that when you didn't know the man because he was never home? Mm -hmm. Or basing your whole life and career on what you've read about him, not because you knew him necessarily because he wasn't there. Or to be a Kennedy or to someday mm -hmm. be an Obama kid. Um, Roosevelt's kids struggled in um, politics. Franklin was a congressman for a while. Elliot was the mayor of Palm Beach. Um, and they all did, but they all also, the other thing they did is they were horrible at being married. I think between the five of them, there are 19 marriages. Wow. That's a lot. Look at it. Well, I guess that's one person's perspective. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, they struggle, I think, being Roosevelt's. And their dad was never home. When he went on these <clears throat> boat trips in Florida, he was gone for months. Mm -hmm. I think they figured out one year they saw him for like 10 days because oh, he was wow. never home. Wow. <clears throat> and even when he was home, there was this attitude of he, I don't think he wanted his kids to be coddled and, and, and soft stuff. You had to, to be on your own. You know, why are you whining about all this stuff? Go be yourself. But how do you do that when you're a Roosevelt? I think that's difficult to do. I think it's a, it's a tough place to be in. And they all struggled really to, um, to do that. And then how does that relationship work when you're Anna Roosevelt and you've betrayed your mother with your father's girlfriend? Right? I mean, that's got to be a difficult thing to deal with. So we'll talk about that uh, the last week or so when we talk about legacy. Because I think, And there's Roosevelt's now that are continuing on in the tradition. Whenever that name pops up, you immediately think of FDR and Teddy. Uh, and they're still around. They're like the Kennedys. You all heard about the latest tragedy to befall the Kennedy family this last weekend. Yeah. One of Bobby's granddaughters um, and her son went to get a ball that was the ball. And they went to get a ball that got off the shore in the canoe and they died. Oh, wow. So, I mean, the name keeps popping up. Like the Roosevelt name keeps popping up. To be in this family, these families, you almost feel like you have to go into public service. You have to be oh. political. Um, so my experience with that he was kind like of Chuck was years ago <clears throat> at the ranch in Wyoming that Amy and I met at um, there's a woman there named Minowa Bell kind of a cool last name and she was, oh, she, she was a hard drinking society type really kind of funny turned out she was Elliot Roosevelt's fifth wife oh wow. so for me as a historian to sit and listen to her talk about she never met Franklin but she met Eleanor but to hear these stories, and I like that idea, I was two degrees separated from Franklin Roosevelt. That makes for me, like I said before, it makes history that much closer if you know someone who knew someone. Mm -hmm. um, right. I love that part of history. Um, so anyway, so we'll talk about that. Yes, Chuck, in a couple of weeks about the legacy of the family. Right. Um, they all struggled with it. The only one who didn't was, was Eleanor. She knew exactly what she was doing, and she made a huge impact after Franklin died. Uh, but her kids really struggled with it for years. So, mm. any other questions? I, I sort of had uh, the yeah. impression that um, the the Roosevelt that you painted at Groton and at Harvard is kind of different from the one that I'm hearing about this time. And well, Groton and Harvard, he seemed to have a hard time um, getting getting respected. And now it seems like he's somebody that lights up the room when he walks in into it. Um, did something happen in between time? Or? Well, I think as, as any of us develop and change who we are, when I graduated from high school, I know this will shock you, I was <laughs> most like Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Everybody chuckle, because that's not a joke. That's serious. Who are you? Yeah, well, it was 1983, so. <laughs> and I thought you were a nice guy. Well, thanks, Marilyn. Um, but I think we all change at some point. It's our experiences in life that change us, and they can change us for the negative or the better. Um, well, I, I've read in several places that that it, Roosevelt changed a lot after he had polio. Yeah, that was a huge. That really, he developed more empathy for yeah, average exactly. people. Exactly, but I think I think to Anne's point too, getting involved in politics and getting that kind of that. Um, a chance 
I think when you're at Groton and Harvard and you're amongst your own, and they know that you're kind of a well, feather duster, so to speak, like, ah, eh, you're not very serious. But you get to get out and take that personality and kind of transform it on people that don't know you and you get to start over again, and they elect you to the legislature, that kind of, that adulation kind of changes who you are and how you operate. Uh, you go to the next level, and now you're in Washington, you're in your 30s, and you're the assistant secretary of Navy. There's a whole nother level of woo that goes along with that, and you kind of change and develop who you are. To think that you can be vice president of the United States when you're 38 years old, something's happened to you in the 10 years since you graduated, or 20 years since you graduated in college. That's amazing. I think we all go through that. And then when he gets hit with polio, I think that changes him again, and that changes how he understands the world and his interaction with it. There's a scene in the movie, A Warm Springs, where Louis Howes, when waiting for that scene, that moment that tells him that FDR is ready to move on from this bout of depression and despair he's been in and try to lift himself out of. And he and Eleanor are watching him. He takes him to the train station in Bullockville, and they're going back to New York. And he sees FDR in one of his hand-driven cars. And a farmer comes up, hey, Mr. Roosevelt, how are you doing? Good to see you. And Franklin says, how are you? And he sticks his hand out. How's the bull weevil problem going on this year? And the wife comes over and she's all, and a bunch of people crowd around the car and Louis in the, in the train, he looks down and he goes, he's ready. So you get to a point where you get yourself out of this morass that you're in and you see that your destiny doesn't have to be derailed by what physically is limiting you, that it's your head that matters. I mean, Stephen Hawking was in a wheelchair for 50 years. It wasn't his body that mattered, it was his brain that mattered. And people, I think FDR, what FDR went through helped pave the way so that people like Hawking can be part of society and thought of, he's not just some poor guy in a wheelchair. Look at this brain this guy has, what he's thinking of all the time. Um, so I think he did change a lot. I think we all do. The Jack Kennedy that went to Harvard and choked is not the Jack Kennedy who died in Dallas. Um, people change. I think in some sense you are who you are what you change in some other ways as you go along. If you don't, I think something's missing in my perspective. Yeah. I gotta tell you, I was watching, the, I was listening to, I don't know you guys about that, I was listening to a clip the other day of Kennedy <clears throat> talking to John Connolly on the phone. John Connolly was the governor of Texas, was in the car in Dallas, was also shot that day in Dallas. Did I tell you all this story? <clears throat> no. <clears throat> it was an audio tape. There's something I love about our internet world, this, you can go and Google stuff and listen to all this stuff. And it's an audio tape of Kennedy. He calls John Connolly. This is November of 1962. Connolly's just got elected governor of Texas. And Jack liked to talk to these guys and figure out in his head where they needed to do better next year, what efforts need to be made in this county. And so they're talking about Dallas. And Connolly says, yeah, we, I think you got beat. The Democrats got beat worse this year than they did in 1960 in Dallas. It was really bad. And he said to the President of the United States, it's just, we really got murdered up there. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. I, I, my hands, my hair stood up my I'm like, what? Wow. Was, he said to the President of the United States, we got murdered up in Dallas. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. Creepy. But wow. that's our world of technology we have now that we can find this stuff out on. So, wow. In uh, terms of the story that you told a couple of classes ago about the cold showers at Groton. Yeah. Um, when you told that story, I was thinking it was kind of phony. The the oh we're we're tough. We have yeah. life is tough, and we have to take cold showers. It's sort of like reality TV, yeah. um, tough. And, and uh, his experiences later in life were were much different than that. Oh but yeah, I think a lot of people that go to places like Groton think that those cold showers make them. Oh, yeah. don't when you're 15 years old and you're away from mommy and daddy for the first time, that's horrifying. <laughs> oh my God, cold showers. I, at home, I had my nanny came in and toweled me off. You know, that kind of attitude. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think that's kind of the start. For him, going away from home was the first thing that changed him. Mm -hmm. and, and having his father die when he was young, that changes him again. And it's just a series. And some people can go through all these changes and not learn anything. And <laughs> Franklin was the opposite. He learned something from every single one of these experiences. Whether it's assistant secretary of the Navy, he's filing names in the back of his head of people, um, of experiences, of understanding, and writing notes about, okay, I went to this shipyard. This is how this ship is built. Not knowing he's going to be president of the United States someday, that will help him because you don't want to be the secretary of the Navy in 1944 
come to FDR and say, well, I don't know about these ships. He's going to go, oh, I was in your job before. You're just wrong. Go back and do it again because that's the kind of guy he is. His brain is just constantly going and just da 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 um, But I think a large part of that shifts after polio. Uh, there are events in everyone's lives that can shift you from this section to that section, and that's just how mm -hmm. it goes. Um, so. Uh, Mike, one question. Yep. The relationship of his mother when he gets polio, I mean, what, does she become more controlling or whatever? I think she thought then it was like, well, clearly, Franklin, I mean, you're not supposed to do anything other than be a country squire. Okay. You can't do it. You should just come home and sit on the porch on your wheelchair, smoke your cigarettes, and we'll talk to you about the farm. Okay. Maybe go to a social event. But his idea of having a political career mm -hmm. was completely out of her head. It wasn't okay. something she liked a lot to begin with, but now she's like, you got to be nuts. Um, but I think he's trying to prove to her and other people that he can do this stuff, that he can make it back. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if he couldn't, he wouldn't have lasted as long as he did. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, he's mm -hmm. one of those people that has a goal, mm -hmm. even if it's just to walk in the driveway. If you've ever been to Hyde Park, and I know Peter has, that driveway from the house to the Albany Post Road isn't short. That's a bit of a hike for a person who can walk, but to do it with, with crutches and later maybe try to do it with the system he's developed, one thing at a time. But he never, he never quits learning about new treatments for polio. Um, even up until the last days of his life, he's looking for new. That's where he's gone in the spring of 24 when he needs to go back to recuperate and get some breath back in him mm -hmm. goes to warm springs okay he can drive around he can go in the pool he can relax he's doing work but that's that's where he goes mm -hmm. and he's always looking for something to keep him doing better mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. wow all right anything else i will let you all know about um next wednesday but my plan is once i hear from them that we will do a zoom session for the folks from campo bello um and as I said on Facebook the other day, when all this is done and we can get back out, um, avail yourself if you have not of going up to Campobello. Get your grandkids or your kids to drive you up there. Um, and if you can too, Hyde Park is a wonderful place. The house is closed till fall um, to tours, but um, it's a wonderful, wonderful place to visit. And you get the total sense between those three places we're talking about next week, who FDR was and who he became by visiting the places he went to mm -hmm. so. Okay. All right, everybody. Happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter, everybody. Remember next Sunday, not only is Easter, it's also the uh, 75th anniversary of Roosevelt's passing. So yep. that's mm -hmm. one of the historical things that kind of pops up on the radar once in a while, 75 years. Wow. Oh, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> All right. Okay. Peace out, everybody. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.